a real privilege and a real honor to have our guest speaker tonight. You know, he's so busy with conferences and things that's going on in Nigeria, and he's leaving probably another 10, 14 days from now. He'll be leaving to go back to Nigeria, get everything ready for our, our conference in October. And I think you, you have another conference before that. Yeah, you have another conference before that, and then a conference for Thanksgiving, then a conference for Christmas, and then one for New Year's, and then Easter, and then <laughs> it goes and starts all over again. But uh, it's a real blessing to have him. I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you tonight. And pray that uh, everyone will be blessed tonight uh, with uh, the words that God has given to our brother. Um, are there any testimonies? No testimonies. Any temptimonies? Oh, you have a, come on. We're glad to have Leisha back. Amen. We missed you. Okay. I guess it's a testimony. Um, I just, thank God I came back. I made it okay. Um, on the flight back, it was kind of tough. You know, it was just a long day. And uh, I, I saw something on, on the news um, at Logan. I guess some people had some trouble on a plane, and they had to actually get evacuated out of the plane and everything. So I just thank God that wasn't me. <laughs> so um, that happened. I don't know if it, I think it might have been that same day. Or it could have been the next day. I'm not sure. Anyway, just thankful to be back. Thankful. You know, I was up in, in Portugal, and I really don't, there's no churches. I didn't go to church. I really didn't get service. So I remember trying to listen to your, your message one night, and the thing kept spinning, and I just couldn't get it, and I was just frustrated. And um, So, you know, it's really good to be back in the house of God and just feel his presence. And as I was worshiping there, I just had such an excitement because I felt freedom and liberty. There was like a spirit of liberty, and it just, it just felt so good to worship, and I just missed that. So that's my comment. I'm just thankful to be back, thankful to be worshiping and have that freedom, because in Portugal, there's like, I, I had a tour, and the lady said in um, Lisbon, there's like 42 churches just in that little city alone, and it's all Catholicism and, you know, a lot of idols and things, and it's a lot of, you know, they don't have this, so we're, we should be grateful. I'm thankful that we have that freedom and that we know the truth because that's all they know, some of them. You know, they believe in Jesus and they, they talk about Jesus, but they only believe in him in, in a traditional form, not in a personal form. So I just thank God for that. Amen. Let's pray that Louis gets saved. We can plant a church in Lisbon, Portugal. Amen. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no? Alicia's like, uh-uh, I ain't moving there. <laughs> Amen. Anyone else before we turn it over there? No? Praise God. Well, we want to invite our brother to come and take his liberty tonight. Amen. Give a good God bless you. Welcome to Bishop Andrew. Amen. Amen. I'm going to somehow change the method I had in mind but because something just happened to my glass, my reading glass. One fell. So, <laughs> okay. Why he's going for that? Let's pray. Father, we give you glory. We give you praise. We give you adoration. There is none like you. There is none to be compared to your, to you in any area of blessings that you have blessed us with. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation that you've given to us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that 
is here tonight. And as many that are viewing this program through Facebook, I ask your blessings upon every one of us. Let your name alone be magnified. Let your name alone be glorified. And let your blessing flow into the life of your people. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you, Lord, for your healing. Thank you, Father, for your deliverance. Thank you for who you are. I am that I am. The God that never fails. The God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. I want to talk on what I call how ready are you? How ready are you for the next great event? How ready? There are about three or four events that have taken place recorded in the Bible. There are many, I'm talking of major events that took the people in that generation unaware. Not that they were not told, not that they were not warned of it, but they didn't take it seriously. And it happened by the time it happened, it took them unaware. Um, before they said they want to make a move, it was too late. The first event was the destruction of the earth with water in the days of Noah. In Genesis chapter 7, or you can start from chapter 6, in short, chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9 talks about Noah. In chapter Six verse Genesis chapter six. Are we there? Verse number seven. So the Lord said, I will destroy man for whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, crippling things, bears of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God said to Noah, I was going to destroy the earth that I have made. And ask Noah to prepare an ark. You know the story. You read it over and over. Noah prepared the ark. But let's look at it. And let's look at what is going on, even our life that we are living today. Noah built an ark. He was not the only one that beauty, that work on the construction. Men, maybe women too, work in the construction. Yeah, women, not maybe. Women work, if they didn't throw any hammer, they prepare food. So they did something towards the building of the ark. And we are told that it took about 100 years for Noah to prepare the ark. And people saw it. And people wondered, 
what is this man doing? He must be crazy, building an ark. And he said God was going to destroy the earth. But Noah, the Bible tells us, obey the instruction God gave to him. He did not doubt God, but he obeyed instruction. I want us to take note of that. If we are going to reign and enjoy the blessings of God, we must learn to obey godly instruction. Sometimes the instruction may not make sense. Because when we look at the account of Noah, what God told him, does it make sense to build an ark, a big ship? But it did. And what happened? When Noah finished it, God said to Noah, you and your seven family, family made up of eight, you and other seven, enter the ark with animal, male, and female. And when he did that, God shut the door. And rain started. By the time rain started falling, the eyes of many people got opened. And now they were crying for mercy. But it was too late. I pray that will not be our portion. The event of Noah took place and many, many, many thousands of people we are taken on our way. In Noah's days, only eight of them got saved. Only eight. Then the one that was not worldwide, but was still very important, was that of destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Two cities and the neighboring villages. Oh, were they away? Yes. Because the angel told Lord, are their relations, your relation, go and tell them. Your daughters, your son-in-law, go and tell them that God was going to rain fire upon this city. No, uh, Lord went. His daughter didn't believe in it. The daughter in, uh, son-in-law didn't believe. The city didn't believe. But what happened? The fire come down, it happened. It took them, by the time it happened, it was too late for the city to repent. Then let's come down to the New Testament. Which is the other one that took everybody on our way? And even to today, many still doubt it the birth of Jesus Christ. The birth of Jesus Christ was foretold to my own understanding right from Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 when he said the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. I believe the seed of the woman was Jesus Christ. Right from Genesis and you come down all the prophets spoke about Jesus Christ. A virgin will give birth. And it came to pass in the days of Joseph and others, Mary, a virgin, conceived and gave birth to a son, Jesus Christ. And do you know from the Birth of Jesus, that Jesus grew up to the best of my knowledge. Theologians, you can prove me wrong, but only one or two persons I will say actually believe that this child is different. And that is Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible tells me, as the prophetic declaration, we are coming forth. Mary was meditating on what was being prophesied 
on Jesus Christ. She kept it in her heart. She meditated on it. She knew quite all right that Jesus Christ was different from others because when the angel told her, you are highly favored, blessed among women. And John the Baptist, in, yet in the womb, testified because Elizabeth said, how can the mother of my Lord come to visit me? Because when you step in, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Amen? She knew quite all right the joy in the womb was specific. And in that says in Luke 1, 43, blessed is he that believed. Blessed is she that believed that every spoken word that God has released will come to pass. They prophesy, but let me tell you, even in that time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't believe. Oh, the death of Jesus Christ was something that the Bible tells us. The Bible prophesied it. The Pharisees read about it every day in the book of Moses. But when it happened, even till now, many don't still believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's another great event that took the world on her way. Some look down on Jesus Christ. But glory be to God that there's another fourth event coming which you and I must be ready for. And that is the second coming of Christ. How ready are we? How ready are we as a church? How ready? There's one thing the scripture tells me that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wash cold. Because iniquity shall increase, Love of many, love to live a holy life, we go down. Amen? Let me say this. Today, some of us are carried away by the deceitfulness of this world. I'm talking of we who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We who says we are born again. How committed are we? We that says we are Christians. How committed are we? We allow the things of this world to carry us away. We allow the things of this world to draw us. Amen? Do you know? Okay, I will get to that place, but let's just move on. Some of the things that carried us away, the things of this world, other things that carried us away, position we are holding. Position. Position. There's something that surprised me. By God's grace, I speak in different churches. I relate with pastors. And one of the things that surprised me among leaders is that there are people who somehow believe in position in the church. Whether they are making heaven or not, it's not their business. As long as that position, let me put it this way. There are people, I have someone, let me just go straight. I have someone, a lady got converted, gave her life to Christ, but the husband goes to another church. And that church doesn't really believe in whether you are born again or not. But the father occupies a specific seat in the congregation. She has his own seat. He normally sits every Sunday. If he doesn't come to that church on Sunday, that seat will be vacant. Nobody sits on it. And when the man passed Oh, when the man died, the pastor of the church now called on this the son and said, you see, 
There's nobody to sit on your father's uh, seat. You better come and occupy your father's seat. And he came and started attending the church to occupy his father's seat. He didn't join the church because he gave his life to Christ. He wants to occupy his father's position. Okay? And when this, that one was done, they now told him, you cannot just be coming alone. Tell your wife to be coming because you are occupying your father's seat and your father's seat is very unique. So your wife has to be by you. So they drew her from the church where she was, she was taught the word of God to a church where she is not taught the word of God. And today, both of them, I'm, I pray that grace will read them before they die. Both of them have denied the reality of Christ because of position. I have seen some churches. You find that deacon in the church, close from the church, the moment they walk away from the church, they come out with their cigarettes and start smoking. This is deacon in the church in America here. I've seen it in America here. And I just preach in that church. Sometimes I like to walk to them and say, man, why not get out from here before you start smoking? A deacon in the church. Why not get home and smoke? Than just leaving the church by the premises of the church, you bring out your cigarette and start smoking. What are you telling the visitors? But the position he's occupying is more important to him than his salvation. Many buy their, their position because you give big offering. No, we run this ministry. If you don't pay your tithe, if you don't give your contribution, we will fold up. I tell the churches that I can tell. There are churches in Africa, there are churches in South America, there are churches in other countries that will rise up against you in the day of judgment. They will say, under the tree we serve God. We have no air condition. Under the rain, we serve God. I own pastor a church. Every Sunday we pray, no rain. Because we fellowship outside. And God kept us. Every Sunday, no rain. And there was a day, rain fell around uh, Sunday school starts 9 o'clock. And rain started falling by 10 o'clock. And some of the members say, oh, would you let pray that uh, there should be no rain on Sunday? But rain fell. I said, listen to me. We all agree. We told God there would be no rain. So God expected by 9 o'clock we all be in the church. So those of you who left home after 9, you broke the covenant, the covenant you entered with God. So God allowed. So Wow. But this time we're already in the church with roof it. And I said, I thank God the rain fell. Because many of you, when I'm preaching, you look at your time. And now rain is falling, you can't go. So I have time to do what? To preach a longer message. Amen? Your position. If your position is taken from you, what do you do? Do you grow annoyed and say, oh, I'm no more going to that church? It means you were there because of position. Position will make us all position in the place of work. You take the place, you work in your office so that you can get promotion. Even when it will affect your Bible study or it will affect your coming to church on Sunday. 
you go for it. Why? Because you want what? Position. Let's understand this. Jesus Christ left his throne for over 32, over 30 years or 13 and a half years. He left his throne to come and die for the sin he never committed. He paid the price not to Satan but to God. He paid the price for my sin. He paid the price for your sin. He left his throne where angels worship him. He is God, but he left his throne because of me, because he loved me. And I cannot leave a job, I cannot leave position to worship somebody who died for me, who gave his life for me, that made me who I am today. I was zero, I was nothing. I was on my way to hell. I was no good. I was drinking sin and drinking water. If not the grace of God, I will not be standing here today to say I'm declaring the word of God, the word of God, the God that created the heavens and the earth, that I am Christ's ambassador. It is his grace. It is because he loved me. And there's no sacrifice that should be too great for us if we know he's coming back again. He's coming back. Paul said, if it is only in this world we have hope, we have of all men most miserable. Why not we eat and drink and do like others? What does that mean? Why not we drink and eat and do like others? It means we have a sacrifice to make. We don't have to be like them. We have hope. We are strangers in this world. We are passing through. This is not our home. We are passing through. We have where we are going. When you know where you are going, you know you are, you are not staying in this place. You don't just start settling down. There are certain things you don't pack. There are certain things you pack. Amen? Let me give you an example. When I came from California to East Coast, when I was coming to East Coast, I knew I could spend about a month plus. I came with two suitcases. But when I was coming to New Bedford, I knew I was going to spend a week. So I didn't come with two suitcases. I came with only one. And even the one, I still dropped some things. Why? Because I know I'm only going to stay for a week. And with what pastor told me today, I started regretting why did that take some of the clothes because I thought I was going to be putting on tie every night. But today he gave me liberty. I said, just come as you are. So, which means one of my shirt, my trouser, my tie will not be worn today. So, maybe next year I will only come with just handbag. Because I am not coming to stay. That is my point. My point is let us live our Christian life as one that has a place going. You have your goal. This world is not your life home. You are passing through. And so while passing through, you have to be ready. You can uh, this is my theory. And every one of you viewing, let's say you may not agree with me. I believe once you die, there's no repentance in the grave. Once you die, that is the end. I believe once you die, your second coming has come. 
But the Bible says those who die in Christ will rise what? First. So I can come and say all oh, prayer, thank you for what you are doing, but it will be difficult for me to do that job. Chaplain. Especially to pray for people who are dying when I know they are not going to heaven. This is Andrew. It will be difficult for me. But I know quite all right. And I do tell them, when one died, what you are seeing there is sand. The person is gone. You can pray all the prayer except you are praying for him to come back, for the spirit to come back into that body. Then, I will agree with you. But praying for that body, that sand, that is sand, you can address. Let me quickly say this. Have you ever been to the funeral? When people will say all beautiful things about the disease, I, I, I do ask myself, what if somebody comes out and says how how funny this person was. How mean this person was. How will they take it? I've never seen it. So, you know, you know see, see her or see him? Oh, he was very wicked. Even when a criminal is dead, you know him, but at that time, you say something good concerning him or concerning her. But are you really speaking? You are speaking to sand. When that person die without Christ is going to die again. But when you die in Christ, you will not die again. Are you ready? Are you ready? None of us is going home yet by the grace of God. But God is telling me to tell you you and I has responsibility because it is appointed unto a man once to die. We are not going to die twice. It's once. You are gone, you are gone. What of if this person you say you love not die in sin without accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and personal Savior? What good have you done to that person? You love this person. You love him to a fault. You love him, you love her that you don't want to offend her. Is that not right? You don't want to offend her. You don't want to offend him. So you call him once on the phone and you tell him about Jesus. He said, don't call the phone again. He said, I don't want to offend Ah, then you stop calling. How many of you have seen marketers? How many times do they call your phone? Marketers. Huh? It's not marketers you call them. Tell them marketers. Huh? How many times do they call your phone? Once? Twice? Even when you tell them not to call again, what will they do? They will still call. They use one way or the other to still call. But we Christians are what? Are shy to call. Because we are so gentle. We don't want to offend anybody. We are giving responsibility. How ready are we? How ready? The street you are living in, how many of them have heard of Christ? The street you are living in. How many, your neighbors, how many of them have heard about Christ? And I want to say this. If you are having a party or your child is having a birthday, do we not call his friends? Huh? Call his friends. And what happened? 
You do a lot of cooking everywhere, feed up. Is that not right? What do you do? Why not hold a surprise party? Oh, somebody is doing bad day. Oh, who is doing bad day? Jesus Christ. Uh, was he born today? For me, nobody knows where exactly when he was born. So I can celebrate the birthday of Jesus Christ today. You can be arguing theological something. I say, I, I have the right. It's my Lord. I can celebrate his birthday anytime, anywhere. Just invite people. And after you cook for them, the next thing you say, we just want to listen to somebody to tell us about how this birthday came up. I'll tell them about Jesus Christ. Someone say, wow, because of Jesus Christ, that's why you, yes. Amen? How ready are we? Noah, the Bible called him a preacher of righteousness. Which means he must have told people. Noah preached. What happened to Lord? I don't know what got into Lord's wife. I don't know. But to me, my little understanding, I believe she was a greedy woman. That is my own understanding. Because the Bible tells her not to look back. Is that she was greedy or she was doubting the, the ability of God to rain down fire from heaven and say, let me really see if it will happen. And she turned and she became what? A pillar of salt. Because Lot was not focused. Lost, lost everything. Because he was not focused. If he was focused, if he understood that the covenant relationship was between Abraham and God, if I were Lord, when Abraham said, let us separate because of the strife, I would tell uncle, I'm not going anywhere. Let's deal with our servants. Let's put our servants in order. Well, Lord said, okay, I can do it. The Bible says he lifted up his eye. He saw the water ground, and he did what? He chose the water land and gave the dried one to Abraham. My point is, Lord has servants. Abraham had servants. Is that not right? Lot has children. Abraham have no children. At that time, they separated. And what happened? Where are the servants of Lot? Where are the children of Lot? Because Lot was not a focused man. That's my interpretation. He lost everything. When you know where you are going, you discipline yourself. When you know what you are pursuing, you discipline yourself. For example, if there is an exam for promotion, and it's about two days, and you need to pass to be promoted, are you going to read or not? You're going to get yourself ready. If you watch television before, what will you do? You shut your television. You discipline yourself to make sure you get what you want. Amen? The same thing. The scripture tells us that we must be careful of the position. Some of us are carried away by the problem of life. The problem of life. 
Maybe we have prayed and prayed and answer have not come. And we decide to try other means. It may be you came to the church and you were told our pastor is anointed. When he prays for you, you will be healed. And you have spent two months, nothing happened. You spent two years, nothing happened. And the sickness is not improving. What do you do? Say, I need to look for another place. Oh, your child is sick. What is that? What is that problem? But there's one thing I want to say. That problem has a beginning. And because it has a beginning, it has an end. Everything that has a beginning has an end. The only person that has no beginning, that has no end, is God. No matter the problem, it has a beginning. And because it has a beginning, it has an end. So don't give up. Be focused. Be determined to see the end of the problem. Give glory to God. And the more you worship him, the more God takes care of that problem. Just allow him to take care of it. Amen? I love what David said in Psalm 23. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maker what? He maker what? He make it. He make it. He make it what? He make it. Oh, he make it you. Or he make it me to do what? To lie down in where? In grass, in dry pasture. Where? In green. Huh? He leaded me beside this world. And he does what? He restore. Who does that? And I love verse 5 and 6. So he anointed me. He prepared a table before me. In the presence, not in the absence, in the presence of my enemy. He anointed me with oil. My cup run it over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all, not some of the days, all the days, but I must allow him to be my shepherd. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. I must allow him to order my footstep. I must allow him to shepherd my life. Then goodness and mercy will follow me. But if I don't have a goal, if I'm not expecting, if I have no target, if I don't want to reign with him, if I believe that everything ends when I die, then I can live any life that I want to live. But when I know this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I'm going to reign. I've started reigning, but I'm going to reign with Christ for eternity. I'm going to reign with him. That is my goal. I want to reign with him for eternity. He paid the price. But I must be ready. I want to be among Noah, with the seven, we are ready. Mary stood with Jesus Christ from the beginning to the end. And even when Jesus died, he resurrected, according to the Bible, Mary was among the people that received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
in the upper room, which means even when Jesus Christ died, because Mary understood who Jesus Christ is, in John chapter 2, they ran out of wine. G Mary went to Jesus and said, they have no wine. And he said, woman, my time has not come. Know what I love in her? She did not argue with Jesus Christ. Amen? She didn't argue. You know, when you know somebody, you don't argue with him. You, I know you. I know who you are. G Mary turned to the people and said, whatever she tells you, do it. Whatever she he says to you, do it. I know him. I know him. And Paul, uh, Paul said, I know him. I know who I have believed. I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed. And he went further to say, in another portion, said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. When you know him, you know he's coming back. He's coming back. We don't know. But the signs, what is happening around the world tells us. Today, the world is becoming like a family, like one. Let me say this. I called pastor to take over. Some years ago, Pastor have been to Lagos. Mama have been to Lagos. But Mama have not been to Ekwoma yet. Pastor have been to Ekwoma. There used to be a time I would travel from Ekwoma to Lagos five hours to make a call. To call U.S. I would travel from Ekwoma five hour journey to Lagos Five hours back. That is 10 hours. Plus the time I will stay on the line. I can spend two hours on the line because the line is long to call international. In Nigeria, there was a time like that. Then things started in developing. It got a time I have to go to Benin. It got to a time there's a hill very close to Ekoma. I had to go there. But today, today, as many that are friends to your pastor on Facebook in Nigeria are seeing me preaching right now. As I'm here, now, I can call someone in Nigeria right now and the person will pick. What am I trying to say? All these things are telling us we are in end time. We are closer to where we are going than when, where we are coming from. We should know that. A pastor friend of mine who just left for Lego, Nigeria yesterday, we were discussing. I said, listen, we should wake up and do what God called us to do. I said, even if I have 40 years on earth here to still preach the gospel, I will not be as strong as I am now, 40 years from now. No. Maybe I'll be working with stick. Either I'm confirmed to America or I'm confirmed to Nigeria. What am I saying? Now that I'm strong, I should do what? Preach. Because a time will come when I'm not able to preach. Now is the time for we to tell our neighbor because we believe there's another event coming. The one of Noah took many unaware. The one of Sodom and Gomorrah took many unaware. The birth of Jesus Christ took many unaware. The death of Jesus Christ, many are still debating it today. 
What of the second coming of Christ? Are we going to allow it to take us on our way? Are we ready? How many of our family are ready? If Christ should come today, are we going to be like Noah or Lot? Which is going to be our story? Are all my children going to be in heaven? Yes. I have preached to them. They gave their life to Christ. They are serving the Lord. But they have a choice to be faithful. I am no more with them. They are all grown up. The youngest is 29. I can't tell her what to do. She's of age. My, my senior son attends a different church. He lives in Lagos. We were talking. I said, son, where did you give your life to Christ? I said, Dad, why are you asking that question? I said, I want to know when you gave your life to Christ. You were pastoring me when I gave my life to Christ. Oh, you gave your life to Christ in my house? Say yes. I said, okay. You know where I'm going to. So, you never gave your life to Christ in the ministry where you are now. You gave your life to Christ in the ministry. Which means, I didn't labor in vain. But that doesn't make me to say it's over. No. From time to time, I still have to. Make sure they have not drifted away from the race. Church, how ready are we for the second coming of Christ? How ready are we for this great event? Whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not, when the time God have appointed have come, he will come. No matter how ready we are, when that time comes, it will come. When the time came for Jesus to be born, he was born. When the time came for Jesus to die, he died. When the time came for Jesus to rise, he rose. When the time comes, the appointed time comes, Jesus Christ will come back. Are you ready? Let's bow down our head. Let's examine ourselves. Have we drifted away? Are you sure that if you die today, you will spend eternity with God? If you have not given your life to Christ today is the day of salvation tomorrow might be too late what are you waiting for why delay you cannot hide under a church God wants to establish personal relationship with you Allow Jesus Christ to come into your life. Allow Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. Are you sick? Jesus Christ is our healer. He took our infirmities and he bore our diseases. By his stripes we are healed. Jesus Christ is our healer. If you can only believe, allow Jesus Christ to touch you.
Father, I pray for as many that have not known you, for as many that have not opened their heart to accept you as their Savior and as their Lord. The Lord, the grace you've released will manifest in their lives. Their eyes of understanding will be opened, will be enlightened. That your light will shine into them and they will see themselves as you see them. And they will give their life to you. Lord, to those who are giving their life to you, but they are lukewarm. Father, let your fire be kindled in their lives. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, let your grace reach these ones that have passed there. Is there anyone sick? You are in pain. I pray the healing power of God upon your life. Even now, receive the healing power of God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you could not do before, rise and start doing it. The grace of God is there for you. Father, give you praise. Help us to examine ourselves. Help us to be self-disciplined. Help us to be our true disciples. Help us to grow up. Help us to live the child stage and grow to be adults. Thank you, Father, for your blessings, for your goodness, for your love, for your grace. Thank you, Father, for your blessings. Thank you for the boldness you're giving to us to share the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus a clap offering as we invite our pastor.